Hello, everybody. Are we live? Can you hear me? Can you see me? I'm not going to waste much time. I want to get right into this. Today, we're going to be talking about the new Devo book. It's a two book, uh, two book in one set, Devo the Brand and Devo Unmasked. It's this one right here. And this one originally came out as a deluxe set, a hardcover set in 2018. Uh, last year, 2020, it was released as this two-in-one paperback book set. So what we're going to do tonight is we are going to peruse this book with Gerald V. Casali of Devo. So let me make sure everything's working, and then we're going to get Jerry in here. Uh, let's make sure that you guys can hear and see me. Okay. Thanks, for everybody, for coming. We're going to get Jerry in here in just a second. Let me just give you a brief intro about this book. Uh, we were approached about doing this book in 2011, and it didn't come out until 2018. So there was that many years that we had to work on this. And it was a kind of a grueling process. Um, the whole process basically started with me going through every bit of Devo imagery that I had in my possession uh, that I'd collected since I was a little kid and uh, going through it and scanning everything and, and getting everything ready to be viewed by the band so that uh, we could pick out the best nuggets, uh, the things that inspired memories uh, and, and, and good stories. So that process took years and years and years. And uh, the final product is what you'll be seeing tonight. So without further ado, I want to bring Jerry Casali of Devo here. And would you all please welcome my friend, Jerry. Jerry, can you hear me? See me? All good? <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, what's that? <coughs> you can hear and see me good? Everything's fine? I can, yes. Okay, great. So here's what I'm going to do, Jerry. Um, I'm using this one camera for both shots, for both me and the book. It's going to be okay. on the book most times, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you take up the whole screen for a couple minutes. And I just wanted you to maybe explain to people the whole idea, basically, of making this a two-in-one book and planned and unmasked and kind of what that meant for you. And and while you're doing that, I'm going to be setting up the camera shot for the book. Okay. Okay, hold on one second. I will make you solo. There you go. Hello there. <laughs> well, um, you know, when you live through something, uh, you are kind of traumatized and also kind of biased because it's like, it's like asking some soldier who's been through Vietnam to hey, tell me about the war, Dad. Um, and, they, uh, and they either don't want to talk about it or their recollections are um, maybe truthful as they can be, but colored by the trauma of experience and, and, and then the change that you go through over time. So we knew all that. We know human nature and we know how memory is plastic and uh, partial and biased. And uh, even if you're trying to tell the truth, you, you may have, uh, you know, memories that are askew or even false. So the reason we divided the book up into two is to kind of, uh, you know, give a nod to the duality of human nature. So on the side called Devo the Brand, that's like what we thought we were intentionally doing and what we tried to do in our art to present to the public once we had to intersect with business and corporations, record companies, promoters, managers, lawyers, and, and what we were finally presenting to the world that we wanted to present to the world given our vision. And then there's also, you know, Devo, the human beings, you know, who are flawed, conflicted, like everybody. And so we know that in this society we live in, especially with social media and uh, kind of tabloid newspapers and TV, that everybody's always more interested in the tawdry, sordid side of humanity and the mistakes you make and how you fuck up. So we wanted to do Unmasked because we realized that Fans and non-fans alike, right, would hear about what maybe went on behind the scenes and what wasn't so successful and, and what, what was conflicted in, 
and what wasn't posed for the camera, you know, and cleaned up for the camera. So it's the, you know, it's the, um, you know, the paparazzi side, right? Yeah. It's right. It's the snapshots, the candid moments. And the baby, the baby pictures. Equally. And we wanted to have everybody that was still alive tell their stories and answer questions, uh, you know, unfettered, on, unedited, on, you know, censored. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's what this is about. So if you really look deep into this book and you read it, you're going, wait a minute. He says that happened there in 1981 in Boston. He says this happened. Like, could both of those things even be true? And uh, I have the same question. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's you know. uh, it's a little bit of the famous Japanese movie by Kurosawa, uh, Rashomon, where everybody's recollections of what they feel is true, even if they're not <clears throat> um, consciously telling falsehoods like our last president, they are possibly telling what they actually believe. So, and I, and I remember Jerry, when we were putting this together, that you made a point of telling me that it was important that we represent uh, conflicting information in this from from everybody involved in the Devo history, right. because because like you said, who you know, it's hard to, to know what really is true and whose memory is totally correct. Um, yeah, and maybe when people read it, they can sift between the lines and figure out who they believe more or what's real and what's not. That's right. Um, and 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 that's that's where the true Devo philosophy comes in because we know that humans, you know, that we call spuds, are, are flawed. Uh, human nature is insane duality, Jekyll and Hyde. That's why myths like Jekyll and Hyde exist. That's uh, right. That's why, the, you know, the mythology of religion with good and evil and the devil and God, that's why it exists because really we, we made all that up because in our own brains, there are two conflicting things going on all the time. That's right. And so we're just going to, I'm just, what I'm going to do is I'm going to page through this and um, I'm, I'm going to try to keep my eye on questions from other people, but I'm just going to page through this and maybe ask you uh, for your memories about a few of these things. Now, this might be interesting to a lot of people. This picture here by Chris Stein of Blondie, uh, to right. you and Debbie Harry. And this was on the roof of their apartment, if I remember correctly, right? Right. So what do you, what do you remember about that day? Oh, well, in reality, it was very hot. <laughs> and we, Devo, of course, being masochistic in our yellow suits, uh, agreed to a photo shoot on the roof of a downtown, you know, uh, brownstone building uh, in the heat of uh, spring. I think it was late spring. Uh, because, uh, you know, I had met Chris Stein in March of 1977 when Blondie backed up uh, Iggy Pop. And Iggy Pop was on the Idiot Tour with David Bowie. And they played, uh, they played it Cle in Cleveland at a famous venue that is escaping me right now. And of course, every rock and roll band that went through Cleveland stayed at Swingo's. And, um, you know, I met Chris Stein then and uh, talked to him about what we were trying to do. He's very nice to me. And I left um, a demo tape and a package about Devo, and he um, and we were in the dressing room with him and and the and the rest of uh, Blondie, and it turns out he talked to Chris. He, he talked to uh, God, Alan Betrock, Alan Betrock, who had New York Rocker, which was the cool, hip, you know, underground music magazine of New York City. And he uh, and, Al, and and so Alan Betrock, who he told me to contact, um, took my call because Chris Steiner actually talked to him. And so I pretended to be Devo's manager, and I went to New York, 
and brought him the videotape of the men who make the music, the three quarter inch videotape of our film and uh, the single and some promo material. And um, he hooked me up with Hilly Crystal and I got us booked at CBGB's. And then I went over to Max's using the fact that we had been booked at CBGB's, went over to Max's Kansas City, pretended to be Devo's manager and said, Hilly Crystal, at uh, CBGB's already wants us and blah, 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 and, and then got booked there. So when we came back to play in the spring at both venues, we hooked up with Chris and the rest of Blondie, and uh, that's when those pictures occurred. Great. Um, so now here we have uh, Devo on Saturday Night Live. This is uh, supposedly from a rehearsal, an early rehearsal for the mm -hmm. live uh, performance. And uh, what now, what do you remember about that day? That had to be uh, a really big day in your life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was nothing nothing less than life-changing. Um, th and that, that rehearsal wasn't just any rehearsal because what you would have to do, we were there starting on a Thursday. And Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right up until the showtime, they ran the show twice a day and then made changes based on what they were seeing. So every time our slot came up on the show between all the comedy skits and commercial breaks, we were, you know, encouraged and, and in fact directed to play as if it's already live. Like, do not fuck around. Show us what you do. Pretend this is really happening. And there were enough like friends and family of Lorne Michaels and the rest of the cast in the bleachers that you did feel like you were already playing to an audience. So the pressure was always on, even in the rehearsals. And each time we played, we saw them making tons of changes in their comedy skits and who got to do which skit and how long the skit was. And these, you know, all these, the cast members were all fighting for screen time. Uh, it was very competitive. So we got to see the whole thing. We were there in the midst of it, interacting with them for the whole thing. And it was uh, just an unprecedented experience because, you know, nothing like this had ever happened in our lives. And, and then, of course, came the real show and the real night when it was live. And that is when the adrenaline rushes and your blood pressure shoots up. And that is when you do or die because – in the dark during a commercial break, Lauren Michaels came over to us with his assistant, and you're in the total dark, but you're in, you're in you're in position because you're the next thing where all the cameras are being lined up, and they've rehearsed this over and over for three days, and he goes, "All right, Devo," and a flashlight comes on and lights his face up like a horror movie. So we're seeing his face lit from underneath with a big flashlight, and he goes. 15 million people are going to see this. So don't fuck up. And when Don Pardo, when you hear his voice and he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Devo, I don't care if the lights don't come on. I don't care what you're thinking. I don't care if your equipment doesn't work. You start fucking playing. And then the light goes off on his face and he walks away. <laughs> so, you know, it's like real chutzpah. It's real, you know, he's a big deal. He's the executive producer of the show, you know, and he wields a lot of power and there's a lot of attitude. And the good thing was Devo didn't blow it. Mm -hmm. We played our butts off and we played tighter and faster than ever. And people didn't believe what they were seeing because they thought that Saturday Night Live had used a videotape speed up trick they thought what, what they were seeing that that wasn't that wasn't 30 frames a second video <laughs> so well, and, and you have to realize that that moment that you guys were on saturday night live was not only a huge moment for you guys but for a lot of us who you know consider devo to be our generation's beatles i mean that was that was when a lot of people discovered a new music they had never heard before and they were never the same again Right. Until that moment, we were a club band and an underground cult band. And the most people we'd ever played to was maybe 400 people 
which we thought was a big deal. So overnight, after Saturday Night Live and 15 million viewers seeing us, we had to stop our little North American 1978 tour that was supporting the release of uh, Are We Not Men and have the promoters rebook all the venues because the venues we were booked in couldn't handle it. Right. So we went from playing these little clubs to two to 5,000 seaters. Overnight. Or, or literally. I yeah. mean, within two weeks, we were back on the road, and that that's what was happening. Well, here's a page that really does showcase a couple of very interesting Devo outfits. And speaking of outfits, now, now people in the chat, I'm trying to keep the questions focused on the book itself since we don't have a whole lot of time. I'm not really fielding a whole bunch of just general Devo questions, but there is one from our good friend, Sophia, our young friend, Sophia, who asked if there are any costumes, Jerry, that you designed for the band that you really wanted to happen that didn't for whatever reason. <laughs> God, there would be too many to count. Yeah, of course. What you, you know, when you see Devo, and you see what we were doing on stage and the way we looked and the way we dressed. How is it? Excellent. My wife just made a drink for the first time called a rainbow quiz. <laughs> All right. Celebrate. Everybody cheers. Yeah. Here, let me show it. Yeah. This is, I mean, it looks right. This is a Ramos fizz. Oh, nice. And that's, um, that's gin, you know, good gin and, um, rose water. Rose flower water. Orange blossom. What's that? Orange blossom. Orange blossom water. Sorry. Orange blossom water. Lemon and lime. Uh, half and half. Uh, seltzer. Egg white. Egg white. Crushed ice all foamed up. You can use a blender or just a shaker. And this is a great Sunday morning drink, folks. And, and just a touch of scrambled eggs and salmon. That's what you want. All just, right. a, just a touch of holy water in there, too. Right? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> Uh, what you see is the tip of the iceberg. We had so many ideas and so many plans. And of course, we wanted to do actual inflated costumes on stage with helium. And we wanted to float on stage with helium and play floating, not with wires, not with, you know, not with stage tricks. I mean, this, these are the kind of ideas we had. And, and it wasn't just ideas, you know, it was like talking to people in industry and research and calling up and going, how big would the costumes have to inflate before we could float? <laughs> you know, <laughs> how, how long does it take to fill them up and how expensive is it? You know, we, we actually researched this stuff because I wasn't interested in fantasies. I wasn't interested in a lot of talk and bloviating. I wanted to do things, you know, I wanted to make it come true. I wanted to execute. And uh, right. that, uh, so there you go. Well, this is something interesting here. I, I wanted to point out to people. Now, this is from your Freedom of Choice era, of course, your most popular album uh, with the biggest hit, Whip It, on it. Now, a lot, not, a lot of people, not a lot of people know that the album was not going to be called Freedom of Choice at first. One of the titles that was kicked around is Time for Devo. Right, Time for Devo. And this pattern here was born of that title. It's the clocks right. and sperm. Clocks and, and sperm, uh, right. Devo you know, giving actually, birth to the future, yes. Right. It's actually the pattern that is on this curtain, this blue curtain right. in the background here. Right. Uh, but we re recreated that for the book, and um, that is where that comes from, if anybody was interested in knowing that. Um, so as we peruse this here, I, I just wanted to remind people that this is the, the brand uh, portion of the book, which basically features – for the most part, everything that Devo, well, not everything, but a good portion of the things that Devo actually posed for and set up for the right. public to see. This was right. all approved of, uh, yes, released, yes. Yes, so this is all the stuff that was orchestrated and planned by the band, all the covers that were designed by them. Um, and it, with a few exceptions in here, there's not a whole lot of behind the scenes and, and things like that. Um, oh, now here we go. This is a... This is a photo uh, from, where was this from, Jerry? England, Hyde Park. Hyde Park, that's right. That's right. And we have some other photos of that in the 
flip side of this book that we'll get into later. And there was a couple of these very uh, important articles that were reprinted, basically giving people an idea of what you guys were thinking and what you were telling the press at certain times in your career. Right. How was well, it? How we, was it? we certainly weren't interested in trends. Uh, if you if you look at um, any given Devo release and look at what was going on in the mainstream culture during that release and the look and sound of mainstream music, <clears throat> you know, it's it's completely divorced from that. It's um, what we were doing is what we were doing. We were conceptual. <clears throat> and, um, you know, when you look when you look at our stage presence and the sound and everything, it's it's unique. It's unique. Yeah. And, 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 and we were experimental and we were idea driven. So then the next record wouldn't just imitate the last record. Right. The record was a new statement, a new look, a new sound. And speaking of speaking of ideas and statements, this <laughs> spread right here was something that I really thought was important to <laughs> include in the book. And what this is comprised of is imagery that you guys had uh, pro projected behind you during the New Traditionalists uh, 1981 tour. Right. And uh, I think Mark uh, says in a caption down here that these were all basically images of things that Devo wanted to warn people of uh, to stay away from for the, for the most part. Yeah, that's why we were using international symbols and ad graphics and things that were ubiquitous to the culture that, you know, get drilled into people. But then, of course, we were divorcing them from their context and, you know, using them transgressively behind us, given the, the, the content of the song. And what we were trying to do with New Traditionalists is to say, listen, man, it's you know, this the society is really going down a wrong path and it's time to think differently. You know, get rid of all these ridiculous, fearful beliefs and ideologies that keep you, you know, trapped right. and start using your brain, you know, to to think. I mean, it is not anything that, that you know, Mark Twain and everybody else and, you know, every American writer that Hawthorne, you know, Whitman, what they all were were espousing, which was uh, individuality and freedom of thought, you know, don't don't become part of the wad, don't become a conformist. Think, like draw your own critical conclusions to the information that you're being, you know, uh, attacked by, basically. Like right. people are constantly trying to con you and and manipulate you and keep you from being free. Right. And this image here really struck. And this is another image that I thought was really important. Just personally, a, 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 just a very, uh, you know, personal thing for me was this image that I saw at the beginning of your through being cool video. I believe it was wow. where Diva was all crucified. And then the crescent at the beginning of the song, they all break the crosses and break their, uh, break their chains basically. But this is such a strong image for me when I was a kid because I was coming out of Catholic school and I, and I had some Catholic damage I was dealing with. So when I saw Devo do this, it really just spoke to me. Well, I grew up Catholic, so that's probably where that came from because yeah. around 15, I made a you know terminal break with the Catholic uh, propaganda. Right. And, and I thought, okay, what if Jesus had just broken his chains? <laughs> like, you know, at a, at a critical point, if he was supposedly the son of God and really not mortal, what if he just like, when everybody thought he was dying and everybody's around him there, what if he just like busted the cross off and walked away? <laughs> <laughs> that we'd have a different world. Yeah. Or at least church would be a little different. Oh, so you bet. It'd be a, is, church this, wouldn't be sad. It wouldn't be a, about guilt and shame. It would be about triumph. This is a great picture that shows kind of how you guys dealt with what was hip at the time. Right. Uh, it's you guys in 1981 posing with an issue of GQ magazine, which was mm -hmm. probably the least Devo magazine or the most Devo, depending on how you look at it, magazine around them. And uh, right. it's just beautiful. Everybody, the look on everybody's face, uh, the pose, 
So great. Do you remember anything about that day? How that magazine? Certainly. I mean, I set that photo up. So, uh, you know, the, the idea, you know, we were working with a great guy, Alan Tannenbaum, and he was game for everything. He created that potato room there. Yeah. I mean, that's a whole room full of potatoes. Uh, they created a, a paper mache cave and then they, they glued real potatoes to it. That's how much people were behind Devo at that point. Yeah. You know, they, they go, what do you guys want? And I said, hey, could you do a potato cave? <laughs> <laughs> and they did. Beautiful. The but mm -hmm. uh, the idea with GQ, of course, it's, you know, it, it's interesting because now you're seeing, you know, this in, in, in this whole push towards um, a move away from the cliches of mainstream culture of white supremacy, where they show, you know, different races and different ethnicities and people of color in the same type of fashions and poses that you always saw, you know, waspy English looking people in, right? And they're saying, no, it's time to show that everybody, like forget, forget you know, marginalizing people and cutting them out of, 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 of mainstream society, give them a voice. Well, guess what Devo was doing then without even knowing it by commenting on GQ in outfits that I designed and we're wearing there were clearly considered a joke. And now they look like fashion. And that was our point then. Yeah. Now let's speak about this picture here with you guys in the beetle wigs. And right. uh, what'd you, what'd you, what did you call this outfit again? Well, this is where maybe we were going off the rails. We were peace Nazis. <laughs> I mean, it really speaks to a lot of the things that are going on today that, I mean, you guys were imagining as this, this joke that could never really become real, but. Well, it was a sense of humor. It's like, yeah. well, what if, what if the people that weren't Nazis were as aggressively and militaristically committed to their values and their cause as these fascists, right? So what if you were kind of peace fascists? <laughs> well, right. like, you know, because we, we live in a culture of grievance where somebody always thinks somebody's screwing them or whatever. And it's, it's always one way though. It's like, there's always the gun rights people that think that, that quote, snowflake liberals are trying to take away their guns. And I don't understand that. It's like Americans have more guns than anywhere in the world. Nobody ever was trying to take them away. Maybe somebody was trying to say, can you wait two weeks? Or why does a teenager have to have an AR-15? But those <laughs> were kind of legitimate questions. Nobody was taking away anybody's guns, right? right? So it was like, well, what if a, quote, snowflake liberal, they had a Glock. And they said, leave us alone, motherfucker. You know, you're <laughs> fucking with us. You say yeah. we're fucking with you. Well, you're fucking with us. You know, it's like, you know, sh showdown at the OK Corral. Now, look at this, Jerry. This is a really good. This is now let me just uh, remind everybody that each part of this, these books goes in chronological order uh, pretty religiously. And um, this is uh, this is late in the game, Jerry. This is right before Something for Everybody was released. You were doing mm -hmm. some test shows at South by Southwest. Uh, mm -hmm testing the new material and some new costumes. Now look at that crowd. That was a great night. Really was. Packed. That was a great night. And because, and I'll tell you why it was, it was, you know, proof positive that in the crowd that at this point, Devo was like um, the high tech version of the Grateful Dead or something where we had three generations of people in that crowd. Right. You know, we had people in their sixties, and we had people in their 40s and we had people in their 20s in that crowd. So we had people that never grew up seeing us at all that only discovered us off of YouTube. Uh, so that proved that we had done something right that lasts. And I think that continuing that thought, Jerry, this album, which came out right after this performance, this album drew in a whole bunch of more people, mostly young kids. Um, a lot of youngsters discovered Devo through this album. 
and went on to get Devo tattoos from this album, uh, you know, lyrics based on this album. So this album was so important to a lot of people. Uh, and I just want to um, I'm I'm happy with that record. I, it was important to me because after not, you know, being able to collaborate and make new music for 20 years, um, I personally had no doubt that we still had a valid aesthetic that needed a voice in the marketplace because the world was more Devo than ever because de-evolution's real. And um, even though Warner Brothers failed to really bring that to market, it was their failure because record companies were all failing. Uh, I think the songs on it, I think several of the songs on it are very powerful. And when we play them in concert, mixed in with our material from like 20, 30, 40 years ago, it was seamless. Nobody said, oh, that's the new stuff. It's time to go to the lobby and have a drink. You know, right. it, it wasn't suddenly wimpy, ballless music. Um, it it held up to what Devo's aesthetic is. Right. And, you know, me being a, a lifelong Devo fan, Devo obsesso, all that stuff, you know, I wasn't, you know, I, I was kind of nervous about the whole new Devo album thing. I didn't know what to expect. And um, as I started hearing the demos and the early versions, I was like, man, this stuff not only sounds current, but it sounds like Devo. Well, yeah. And how else could it sound? I mean, you're Devo. You can't not sound like Devo. That's right. If we would have tried to sound like something else, that would that's what's embarrassing. It's like when groups uh, forego who they are and what their vision was. And suddenly, hey, there I am getting my scholarship. There That's I am. it. Now uh, look at this. Yeah, my scholarship to college. There you go. He was handing me a check. Okay, uh, so that was a dean of Kent State University. There. Now this is the the part that Jerry is not a big fan of of these books is the baby pictures. But I got to tell you, these two pictures were pictures that Lisa Casali showed me when I first met her. Um, I scan, I scanned copies of them, or maybe I just made colors Xeroxes of them back then, but I kept them for many years. And of course, Lisa, I never saw the originals again, but this photo here is really interesting to me because it's you and your siblings and you're pointing a laser gun at your brother. <laughs> I mean, I just think it's, it's so great. You got the, that was, um, that was a ray gun from uh, flash Gordon that they sold as a toy. And I loved ray guns. And I have my brother, well, two brothers actually, in the wagon. Right. That I used to pull them in. So it's Bob and David. That's great. And you were a, a spiffy dresser even back then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here's here's something interesting. You know, your early Kent State IDs showing that you were already playing with costuming and headgear. I was trying to become a, I tried to change my name legally to, to this guy, single name, you know, way before Prince became the symbol, I tried to become Protar and that's Protar right there. Uh, right my earliest incarnation of Protar, the, uh, the graduate school ID that you had on the former page yep. was my, that was Protar in reality. Uh, I had that, made by a local artist in Kent, um, Zorn, Bill Zorn. He made that headband for me. And, you, know uh, much, you look like Alex Casali a lot right there. Yeah, yeah I will. Yeah, everybody says that. You really do. Um, so here's some early artwork that you did that, yeah. uh, you know, before Diva was really a thing. Um, really interesting to see how all this stuff just became what you guys became basically. Um, yeah. Here, this here is a, this is a flyer that I found inside a Devo reel to reel tape. Yeah. And I guess it was something that you were kind of designing as a, a cover to the demo tape or whatever you would distribute. And also I used it um, on, on po not posters, but whatever you would call it when people all used to like take things and, and paste them to telephone poles. That was how you advertised your gigs. Sure. And so when Devo was playing in JB's at Kent, Ohio, 
I actually got arrested for putting those on the poles. <laughs> That's great. What are you in for? Ah, I was putting a Devo flyer on a pole. Yeah. And here's your band, uh, the Numbers Band from Ohio. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there you are in the shade. There I am. Well-dressed again, yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, just thumbing through here. You know, just to keep you guys on track, we're already halfway done with this stream. So I'm just trying to get through some of the most interesting stuff. Now, Jerry, this picture here is a picture of your mask collection that I actually took myself over 20 years ago when I first visited your house. Yeah. And I was so mesmerized by all the cool old masks, some of them that you can recognize from old Devo videos. Yeah. Uh, and then here, here's you as Chinaman. Chinaman. With the world yeah. of rubber van behind you. Now, what, what was that day all about? The, well, that's we, we were at the Good Near Museum uh, taking early promo shots of Devo because um, Chuck Statler, you know, our collaborator in the videos and my personal friend since 1968, he knew somebody at the Goodyear Rubber Museum, and I went over there and convinced them that it was this was a fraternity joke. <laughs> and uh, that's the only way we got in, and we, we got to take those pictures in front of all those displays in the Goodyear Rubber Museum. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is a really interesting story. A lot of Devo fans know it, but there's a lot of people watching right now that probably don't know the story of this mask. Can you give us a little brief history of that mask? Uh, I was with my friend and early collaborator, a uh, poet friend, Bob Lewis, who you know was integral to the early kind of formulation of Devo as a philosophy and Devo as an art movement and literary stuff. He was a, he was a poet and a writer. And uh, we, we would go around to all the novelty stores and secondhand stores. And I found this old ski mask that was completely, you know, weathered and destroyed. And I thought, oh, my God, this is hideous. And I put it on and he and his girlfriend started laughing. And I bought it, you know, for whatever, $2.50. And um, I kept putting it on and starting to, like, you know, talk funny and develop characters and i decided i was gorge and so we hit on this character gorge and then he helped me write this poem right there and i created this gorge holy card where gorgeous on the front so mm -hmm. gorge is a spaceman that had been mutated by his trip to space and he was not always thus and the, the poem is a satirical attack on all the horrible people, you know, like illegitimate authority, policemen, politicians, nuns, priests. Yeah. You know. And, and, and that's, part, that's part of that's the part of Devo that really uh, drew me in when I was a kid, because like I said, when I was 10 or 12, I was just deciding at that point that I was not Catholic and I was uh, pretty much atheist at that point. So you were the first band that dealt with any imagery like that or any lyrics about that. So it really drew me in. Now this. Well, we, um, we think atheism is a good place to start. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody here says that there isn't some kind of God, but right. I guarantee you he's not the God that organized religion says he is. Sure. Um, because Organized religion says, I got my God and, you know, I'm going to kill you because your God's different, <laughs> which is very hilarious. Um, it, you start by not believing anything, and that's a good thing. Right. Um, and, and, the, and that doesn't mean you're not spiritual because being spiritual is totally different than being some kind of orthodox religion person. Right. Uh, because that's, that's adhering to some kind, you know, you might as well just be a member of the Democrat or Republican Party or, you know, the fascists or whatever, right. or the Proud Boys, because you believe things. It's like, no, don't believe anything. Right. Uh, start with thinking. And if you're truly spiritual, you will not impose your beliefs on other people. It's just like when I was growing up, I found that, and I consider myself a spiritual person, but I consider, uh, rock and roll really music and, and this whole thing that I'm involved with in my life. That's where I get my spiritual highs. That's if I'm at a concert that I really 
wanted to be at. That's a religious experience for me. And it sounds yeah. ridiculous, but that's where I get my, uh, my spirituality. So this photo I wanted to mention um, is a great spread. It's very early days of the band, obviously. And actually, this was two photos that Bobby Watson took, and I melded them together so it looked like everybody on stage at the same time. I think the <laughs> photo, the photo maybe gets divided right around. The only thing is, is that could have been. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, another was, photo would have shown exactly that. <laughs> yeah, well, what it was was like she took a picture of this side of the stage and then she right. took a picture of this side of the stage, and I just kind of put them together. But it really is a fantastic shot. Everybody's in action. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's just perfect. Um, so moving along here, uh, there's, a, there's another spread coming up here that I want to uh, show people. I'll get to, uh, here we go. Okay, now I remember we were working this out, Jerry, and you, you weren't really into the idea of me putting this in here, but this was really important to me because it's basically the coffee table in uh, Devo's or, or Bobby Watson's apartment. Yeah. What it shows is is the first record uh, sleeve right here, the first single pile of those, uh, the little dot stickers that you, you use to to hold the inner sleeve together. Yeah, because it was a threefold. Right. I just thought that was so interesting. And then there's like cigarettes. That it looks like a little canister here with pot in it or something. You know, it's like it's just so uh, <laughs> reflective yeah. of time. And then here's boxes of your first single. I thought that That's was really it. important. <laughs> Really important. They, that's after they'd been put together and all boxed up. Right. So I thought that was a really cool thing to show people. Uh, and here's you guys uh, at the side of, of some video shoot going over the uh, storyboards. Yeah. You were always, always in control of your aesthetic and your direction. That was the point. Yep. It was a do it yourself DIY, DIY band. I mean, of any band certainly of any band that I like, but really any band in history, Devo is the, is the one that really has a, such a wide variety of looks and aesthetics and each album it changed. And uh, you were just dedicated to that the whole career, which is really fantastic. Look at this action shot, Jerry. I know. How about um, that? And Bob there was, Ball was a real performer. No you know? strings, no strings and no inflatable suits. He's just in the air. <laughs> Yes, and he, he, you know, he was the most rock and roll oriented person in the band, and yeah. that was a good thing. And he still, he still is. He still does that stuff on stage. Uh, maybe not that high of a jump. <laughs> yeah. But now here's a really rare photo of you guys in street clothes. I guess uh, sound check at uh, maybe Max's Kansas City. Yeah, it's either Max's or uh, or CBGB's, but it, I I don't know. So yes, it's the same month, same right. week. Yeah, right. Yeah, and here's some uh, papers showing how much you guys got paid. Uh, yeah, big time. In Max's Kansas City. I think you guys got uh, 143 dollars, something like wow. that. Yeah, you're big time. So here we go. That'd be about a thousand. That'd be about twelve hundred today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. And there's so much great reading in here. I mean, the pictures alone are well worth getting this book. And by the way, you can get it at www.devobook.net. It's a great book. It really, really Jerry, the amount of work we put into this and the amount of uh, images that we had to go through. And, you know, once you pick the images, then you have to get them cleared, which was a hurdle that we. There's a chart I made right there. Of, is comparing. Um, Comparing the various uh, offers for records, yeah. That's right. And that, that was taken from a really grainy kind of small photo, but we cleaned it up enough <laughs> so that it, uh, it works. So just moving right along here, great early shot here. Uh, yeah. Before, before you had the black belts. That's right. We, yeah, we hadn't even found those yet, yeah. Now, talk I mean, about we actually didn't find them. I had them made, but yeah. Talk about this. When you guys did early shows, you would carry these rubber, basically body bags around. Yeah. And I think the story I remember that you told me is that you would just get fans. Of, yeah. Typically girls is what you were looking for to get in those bags. Yeah. Because, you know, they had seen the truth about the evolution where we were in the bags. And so, yeah, we'd bring them around and find local fans to get in them to perform on stage for Jocko Homo. So it was a very theatrical band. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of sweat. 
Now, here you go. Yeah. How, big, how big of a time in your life was that, Jerry? What were you thinking right then? And then what were you thinking the next morning? How, how did your psyche change after that? Well, you know, the fact that um, the person I basically idolized recognized Devo and, and, and gave us uh, his, his anointment, you know, his, his approval was uh, incomparable. It's hard to even describe, right? It's, 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 it's like you've, you've just been given credibility that you would have never had. And uh, I was prepared for the moment because I always thought this is what should happen. And I had spent so much energy and time making this happen that the meeting was just the, you know, the payoff. The, the end result. Yeah, and, and I made David laugh all night. I mean, I was, you know, there he is laughing. I made him laugh constantly. And there he is introducing you guys. Yep. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm only imagining that at that time, within these like two or three years, you must have been waking up every other morning after a, a big life-changing thing happened to you. I mean, it must have been just happening constantly back then. Well, yeah, the development and the ramping up of energy and opportunity was exponential. In now, 77, the end of 77, it explodes with the Bowie at Bowie introducing us at Max's. That was that was it. Right. And now this is a really interesting time here. This is when you went to Germany to yes. record the record. And you were at Connie Plank's studio, if I remember correctly. Mm hmm. And this guy here in the uh, the black uh, headpiece, head and here kissing uh, 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 Mark and the rubber mask, and dancing around, and all that—that's that's Brian Eno. That's right. I mean, I I never expected him to be such a goofball. <laughs> it, it, you know, in, in general, he was not. Right. We I think we got him going. We we got him out of his comfort zone. It's really fantastic. These photos and these are you know. While we were working on this book, I had the opportunity to like basically dig through Devo's junk drawers, right? I was digging through boxes that were in storage and pulling out little gems like this that were hidden, mm -hmm. uh, forgotten, you know, years ago in somebody's junk drawer. So really glad to find some of that stuff. Here's more at the Connie Plank studio. Now, is Connie in one of these photos? Uh, you know. See the big I, bearded guy? Mm -hmm. No, I mean he had beard, um, but that's not him. Okay. Uh, Connie was bigger guy than that, like more. He looked like a Viking warrior. Oh, right. <laughs> and I'm not sure he's in the book or not. I'd have to look through it again. Right. I'm. And where, what page are you on there? You're on the. You're on the uh, unmasked side. Unmasked, yeah, unmasked seventy six seventy seven. Now, if you, have you got the hard copy there or the soft copy? I got the soft cut. Okay, good. Because I think maybe the page numbers may have changed in the. Yeah, they changed. Yes. Because we added more material and some reviews going. I mean, in. the book is worth every penny. It's just nice to have all this stuff in one spot. I wish they would just print more of them personally, but. I think they're going to print more of these, no? I don't know. You tell me. I, they never explain anything to me. I'll find out. But this one seems to be doing well, and it's affordable at least. Here's an interesting picture, Jerry. This is um, uh, Saturday Night Live again. This is way more behind the scenes than we've seen before. And I think this picture was taken fairly illegally by Bobby Watson. Um, she was told yes. not to take any pictures, but she snuck this one. Yeah. Uh, and it shows the, the division between the sets on, on – Right. That's how, everything was so tight. It was insane how small that studio was. Each each stage, you know, on television it looks big, but it's each stage is compact and, and you're right on top of the people in the next stage. So you're seeing and hearing everything that goes on. Right. It was very crude and very claustrophobic. Mm -hmm. Starwood, that was an important place for you guys. Absolutely. That in our early, you know, time in the clubs out there, uh, Starwood – was where we really launched before we moved on to the Whiskey of Go Go and you know all these other venues. Yeah, and um, oh, now here this is interesting. 
I know there's a lot of Neil Young fans out there uh, in my YouTube friends list and, and the viewers here, and not a lot of people, not a lot of fans of of of, of Neil know about this movie, uh, The Human Highway. Now, how did this come to be, and how did Devo get to be a part of that uh, briefly? Well, in one of our first Star Wars gigs, um, Tony Basil came to see us at at the Starwood with her then boyfriend. Um, Dean Stockwell, the actor who ends up in late life being famous in Blue Velvet as Ben, and and Iggy Pop. She brings Iggy Pop there. And, uh, and I just remember, we had seen Iggy Pop maybe nine months earlier, eight months earlier on the, on the Idiot Tour with David Bowie playing keyboards in Cleveland. And she brings... Iggy backstage, but now Iggy has chopped his hair completely into a punk haircut. He's wearing um, wire rim glasses. He's dressed just very straight. And she introduces him as James Osterberg. And I go, oh, hi, James. And, and he goes, and, he, and she goes, that's Iggy. I go, Iggy? Yeah. She goes, Iggy Pop. And I look over at James and I laugh and I go, oh, right. Like, he got really pissed off because <laughs> I didn't recognize him. <laughs> but anyway, what happened there was well, they loved what they saw so much. And I immediately connected with Tony and she gave me her number and I gave her you know, within days, uh, the single, like many copies of the single and the promo material and a videotape. And she went up north with, with Dean Stockwell, who was working on this early incarnation of Neil Young's idea, The Human Highway, for a feature film. And they gave Neil this stuff and said, hey, you got to see these guys. They're going to come to San Francisco and play Mabu Hay Gardens. you got to see them. And so he did, and he lost it, and he met us backstage and asked us to be in his movie. That's great. And we couldn't believe it. Neil Young, the grandfather of, you know, Granola Rock, was, was into Devo and wanted us to do that. And as we got to know him, he was so cool and so funny and nothing like what my, you know, assumptions Pre preconceptions were nothing at all. Yeah, there's a certain part of that movie that's 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 really kind of highly respected and and um, and and viewed. When whenever it gets on YouTube, before it gets pulled down, everybody shares it. It's the jam session that you guys did. It was into the black. Yeah, is that the song you did? And it was great. Yeah. Neil got into it, and he was just uh, a character I'd never seen before. Yeah. Now, talk about this. This is getting a lot of comments right now uh, from people in the chat about you and Gary Newman sharing some uh, caffeine here. What, what's, what, was, what was that about, and uh, what were you talking about? Do you That's, remember? Uh, Gary Newman played the Santa Monica Civic in December of 1979. He was already a big star in England and, and now breaking big in America, and he was way bigger deal than Devo. But he heard of Devo, and I was a Gary Newman fan, like – I loved Gary Newman and, uh, um, you know, Elliot Roberts uh, made sure that I got tickets to see Gary Newman and backstage passes. And um, I was there with uh, Tony Basil, who's not in this shot, but there are other shots with her that I don't know where they are. And Gary was very nice. and. I talked to him about his show because his show was theatrical using neon and platforms and theatrical stage lighting. He, you know, and he was working with this guy. I, I got the name of the guy. Never got to use him, but I got to use his uh, his compatriot, his the guy that he worked with, right, Dominic, on our next on our 1980 tour. So it was a big night for me because it was just wonderful to. Talked to Gary Newman after this great show, and Gary was doing something and looking like something and sounding like something that nobody else was doing, and that was the whole point. It was like, to me, that was like Devo. 
Right. And here you were mentioning earlier in this stream about the inflatable costumes. Here's some uh, early sketches of those right here. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I would, Mark, you know, Mark and I would collaborate all the time and I would talk about something. And as I was talking about it, he would draw it. Right. You probably on flights to and from uh, the U.S. Uh, where you had a lot of downtime. I'm sure a lot of these. Definitely drew a lot on flights. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so moving right along here. Now, here's the section I wanted to talk about. And in particular, because these two photos here are some of the other photos that I found uh, at Lisa Casali's house decades ago. They were some of my favorite photos I'd ever seen of Devo, just because it's this rare casual moment with the ducks. And, you know, she told me a story about how you got bit by this goose or duck. Or <laughs> yeah. And, uh, uh, I know, didn't know you were supposed to be afraid of these ducks. <laughs> our, so our, our dear friend, Lisa Casali, who took these pictures, uh, the widow of uh, Jerry's brother, Bob, she just passed away a couple of few weeks ago. And, uh, it's very sad, but I was really happy to get those photos in here. I just thought that they were just so cute. <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, yeah, that's between shots. When the official photographer was not doing anything except maybe right. loading his camera, and we were just screwing around. And these are Japan. And Japan, I, was, yeah. I was really happy to get to use these photos because the book, uh, the book publisher were, were real sticklers about getting – permission and getting photo yeah. credit for everybody. And, and they didn't want to pay for anything, including right. all the great articles from Trouser Press. It's so sad. There's so much more that we said and did that is not in the book right. on that level. But at least things that did get in are good. Right. And so these are, are pictures that I had to convince Hold them. on. Yeah. I it's said, look, whoever took these photos was a fan in Japan they sent them to the band, and I'm sure that wherever they are, dead or alive, they would like these photos to be in the book. So if there's any problem, we could pay them off after. But So I, I convinced them to use these photos, and I could not convince them to use a whole lot of photos that we couldn't get uh, you know, permission for. So that was a couple. Oh, Jerry, are you still there? I think Jerry went bye-bye. Let's see if I can find him in the backstage area. No, I think he just... Uh, I think something happened with Jerry's uh, internet or something. We'll see if he gives me a call or whatever. In the meantime, we will keep paging through this book. Um, here, you'll see some more um, notes on videos, storyboards that they would create before they actually shot the video. And there he is. How are you? Okay. Um, so I was just going over some more stuff saying that how you guys have, you know, you, you've had these, this, this great aesthetic. I mean, there's so much, like you were saying, like, there's no way that we could ever put everything we wanted to, to be in this book in it. There's just so much stuff. I mean, these photos of the 1981 tour, uh, very rare. Any video footage or any photos from this tour is very rare, which, I, which was why I thought it was really important to put these images. Yeah that you broadcast behind you in the book, because unless you saw that tour, you, you never saw those images. Well, that's what's so sad is that in, in that era, documentation was very scant. Like right. only the mega selling radio acts were getting any kind of real video or film on them. It was impossible to get anybody to shoot Devo and they all wanted so much money, and the record company wouldn't come up with it, and we didn't have it. So, you know, unlike today, where everything we did would have been really documented, which would have been tremendous, because then you would have proof of concept over the top. Sure. All of our sets, all of our theatrical lighting, all the different costumes. But this is this is what we have, is, you know, these kind of, scant artifacts that are mysterious and incomplete and you know mysterious to tell you tell you a story right and we're almost done here jerry if we can just keep you on for a few more minutes until we finish this yeah yeah i have to go yeah okay so i just want to tell people about this there was a a, a, a fanzine basically called the brainwasher that devo put out one issue of one and, issue uh, it had a section called tell us devo where fans <laughs> supposedly fans wrote in asked devo questions and the, the interesting thing about that was based on this Fabio card. There was a card, a trading card, Tell Us Fabian, uh, 
right? Fabio, Fabian. And uh, that's where the idea came from, which I thought was really, really interesting. Well, we often did that. We often took parodies of very lame, like bland, mediocre shit from the 50s and 60s and twisted it. Right. Oh, speaking of uh, twisted, Spaz, uh, Spaz Attack here, your friend who started many videos. I heard from somebody who knows him that he is still alive. Yes. Uh, and uh, But we're still trying to find him. Oh. oh, I can find him. Yeah, let's find him. Yeah, Tony knows exactly where he is. Tony I Basil. To talk to him or just say hello. Send him some Devo stuff, whatever. What a talented guy. He was yeah. great. So here's, now, here's a letter from uh, John Hinckley. Right. To a radio station professing his love of Devo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he tries to get them to play Devo. I don't know. I think he says, you know, seven times a day or whatever it was. He he, he uh, indicates that he wants Devo played a certain yeah. time. Uh, there's some good pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There I am at Halloween time. Yeah. Yeah. It's always Halloween for Devo. Now here we're getting yeah. later, later stuff here. We're almost done. This is your... This is the first show I ever saw Devo perform where I was kind of, you know, privy to being backstage and I knew you guys. That was Park City uh, Sundance Film Festival. Right, where the heaters didn't work and we were playing in below freezing temperatures. Right, and every, all these Hollywood people were there. Uh, yeah. I don't remember the names of them because I don't know Hollywood actors very well, but but I remember Mark telling us that night, telling me, you better enjoy this because this is the last Devo show ever. And then, of course, right after that, you guys did two Lollapaloozas in a row and uh, really started taking off as far as live performing. Um, so we get in the later years here. You still you still see packed crowds, packed house. Yes. Uh, we have after party flyers. Uh, there's the Devo crew, 2005. And here, even in these later days, 2009, 2010, Jerry is still playing with rubber masks. <laughs> yeah. How could you not? I know. Not? And this is an important time here. On Stephen Colbert's show, he was such a Devo fan and so nice yeah. to us. Yeah. What a great guy. And that's right before he really took off with his late night show. He's really small. And here, I want to point this out, Jerry. You being airborne, I think I have – five or six photos of you on this tour airborne like that. Look at yeah, there's two well, of them. I couldn't help it. Two of them, they're right there on the same page. You airborne. It's just amazing. <laughs> just amazing. So there's the, our, our thank you general boy spread. He was very important to the whole history of uh, their aesthetic, really. I mean, he was in, in the videos. Uh, he introduced you maybe once or twice at live gigs. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of forced you to let him introduce you. <laughs> Well, you know, we, we had a guy ready to play General Boy. General Boy was a made-up character. And we had a guy ready to play, and he bailed two days before we were supposed to shoot. And so, you know, it was like, hey, Mark, what do you think if we ask your dad? And he goes, I'll try to talk him into it. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> That's great. All right, so let me uh, get us back on. Uh, hold on a second here. Boom. Okay, well, Jerry, I have to thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, I wanted to do this after Christmas because I figured a lot of Devo fans would have gotten this book for Christmas. So I wanted to give people a chance to get it. And uh, I'm sorry if I couldn't take everybody's questions from the chat. Uh, but yeah, thanks, Jerry. I appreciate your time. And uh, everybody loves the book. Again, if anybody wants the book, www.devobook.net. Maybe so, you could do another session where we let people ask questions. And Well, we were letting them ask questions, but a lot of the questions were not book related. They were just general Devo questions. So I was, I really trying, to, I was trying to stick to book questions because of our limited time here. I see. Um, but yeah, Jerry, of course, you're welcome to come back and talk about whatever. And I really appreciate you being here. Um, and we love you. And uh, All right. so- Take care. Back to survival mode. See you, Jerry. Bye-bye. All right. Great. Cool. Thanks, Jerry. All right, everybody. Wasn't that cool? Now, I can hang out here a few more minutes and um, see if anybody has any questions. I'm sorry. I It was really difficult for me to look at the chat. Um, thanks, everybody, for the likes. 
and subscriptions, of course. Uh, if anybody was donating tips during this evening's broadcast, thank you for that as well. It's much appreciated. Um, so yeah, if anybody has any questions uh, for me, uh, we really appreciate Jerry being here for an hour. That was great. Uh, the hour flew by, didn't it? I really tried to get through the whole content of the book, get some uh, memories and recollections from, from Jerry, and I think we did a pretty good job of that. Why ask for more book pressings when they are still for sale? Well, that's what I'm saying. I, I, think, I, think, I don't think these are going to be a limited run. I would hope not. I, I would hope that they would keep these in print for a while. But, yes, they still are available for sale. And um, like Jerry said, worth every penny. Uh, they're much more affordable than the uh, hardcover versions that came out in 2018. And let me remind you, we started working on this book in 2011, and it didn't get come out until 2018. There's a lot of work that went into this. And uh, James Barrazzo, I see your question about the Shout Tour, and I don't know exactly why it was canceled, but sure it was had to do something with the record label not wanting to back them financially anymore. Mm. at that time. Okay, so uh, Tim, my moderator, has sent all the questions to me in an email. So what I can do is maybe next Thursday, I can go through those questions and answer what I can. I was really trying to stick to book-related questions only. Every time I would look at the chat, I would see questions about not really the book. So, um, so I kind of just overlooked those. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Hop Frog, if you asked something specific I didn't get to, I'm really sorry. Um, I was just trying to pay attention to Jerry and the book. Um, hey, Christy, thanks. Thanks for the tip. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so anybody who likes this kind of content, Devo stuff, if you're not subscribed to my channel, please do. I do this kind of thing all the time. And... Um, how tall am I? John says I'm six, three, six, four, something like that. My posture, if my posture is bad, which it usually is, I'm six, three. If I'm standing up straight, could be six, four. You know what I mean? Uh, so yeah. Uh, if you guys want to hang out for a little bit, I'm game. Um, so uh, ready for devotional 2021 says Janice. Well, yeah, of course I'm ready, but you know, I don't know what's going to happen. We're all waiting to see what's going to happen. Um, Jason Lindsay is here. It's good to see everybody here. I'm really glad. Oh, Nick. Thank you for the donation, Nick. Appreciate it. Uh, much appreciated, my friend. Um, ba, 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 7.40 a.m. Bigger in size than expected? I guess. Um, reading some chat questions here. I hope to see Jerry at the next devotional. Well, if Jerry's at most devotionals, so I'm going to say that that's a pretty good bet. Um, okay, so what do we got going on here? Uh, what do we got going on here? What do we got going on? I'm trying to find your uh, questions. Uh, 740 AM asked, Jerry, why are the sections about Oh No and Shout so short? Oh, that was about the book. Okay. Well, the sections on Oh No and Shout in the book are so short because – it's likely that we couldn't find a whole lot of imagery or we couldn't get uh, clearance on all the imagery, but certainly shout had very little imagery uh, from that era and um, really had to scrape the bottom of the barrel to find good stuff uh, to put in there. We didn't have a whole lot of the original artwork, uh, the poster artwork. Um, I was really relegated to what I was finding, like I said, in Devo's junk drawers and, and in storage and boxes. And so, you know, old slides that we had to scan and, and blow up, but, uh, but we did what we could. And uh, yes, uh, Diane, uh, Diane Koskela says she loves the shirt. I assume she means this one. You can get this shirt, which is called Devo's leisure wear shirt at middle of beyond.com. That's middle of beyond.com. They have it for pre-sale right now. Uh, the first batch sold out uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, the pre-sale is up now until February 15th. So after February 15th, the pre-sales will close. We will place our order for the shirts, and then in a month or so, they'll be over here ready to ship. Um, yeah, uh, so good to see everybody here. Cardinal Sin, you uh, with the super chat. Thank you, my friend. Very nice of you. Um, 
Okay, so uh, Todd Camp asks, you might have already talked about this, but how much new material is there since the hardback? Well, not a whole lot. There's a whole bunch of, uh, you know, typos and um, little misinformations here and there. Maybe a date had to be changed. Maybe a photographer credit was wrong. Stuff like that. I added a few more image images. Uh, I know there's a few images added to the discography section you know, of all the little record covers you see. Uh, there was... Um, maybe a pin back button, maybe a, a, an ID card that was in, little things. I just um, added in when I saw some dead space somewhere. So I, I wanted to try to fill a lot of the white space that was in that book with uh, random things. I am hop frog. Oh man. Thank you, brother. Very much appreciated hop frog. That is very sweet of you. And Matthew shoemaker. My goodness. This is great. Uh, thanks. 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 Uh, Matthew says, thanks so much for hosting this and for being so active on here, Michael and Jerry, both are so generous with devotional material. Well, you know, as Jerry told me the other day when I asked him how he was doing, he said, well, I'm in survival mode. And as we all are kind of these days, I mean, whether that be financially survival mode or mentally survival mode, trying to, you know, avoid depression and loneliness during this uh, weird period we're living through right now. So we hoped that this stream would alleviate that some of that for you. And, uh, you know, we, I really wanted to dig into this book with you guys, uh, with the public and with Jerry of Devo. I've, I've been wanting to sit down with a, a band member for a long time publicly and show this stuff and talk about it because I've talked about it with these guys for years, but I just wanted to finally share it with you guys. Bruce, what's up, Bruce Dennison. Thank you, Jerry AMA, please. He literally asked for it. Right. I agree. I agree. Um, the book is priceless, Rick Reed. I got to tell you, man, uh, the whole time that I've been collecting Devo stuff, and I think literally the whole time I've been a huge fan in collecting, when I would find certain images or posters or whatever graphic material, I would always think in the back of my mind, oh, this is good for the book. Like just imagining that someday there would be a Devo book and it actually happened. So when it got to the point where I was like, oh, okay, uh, now there's a book on the table, a, a book deal, and now I've got to actually sift through all this stuff I've collected all these years and scan it and then present it to the band somehow. I mean, how do you present the band with thousands of photos, right? Well, we tried a, diff different methods over the years. We tried digitally trying to share them. That didn't work quite well. I flew out to LA with a box of stuff, you know, just booklets of slides and everything. So we tried a few different methods to get to the bottom of what Devo really wanted in the book. And eventually we boiled it down, right? We boiled it down. Um, oh, Catherine B says she's very excited to read it. Honestly, I got it for Christmas, but haven't really had the time to read it. Yeah. Sit down, uh, you know, and, um, and, uh, and read it. it. There's some really great, interesting stories in there. And like I said, uh, like Jerry said, there is some, uh, you know, uh, information that contradicts itself. Probably uh, somebody remembers something happening this way. Another person remembers it happening another way. And Jerry wanted that to be in the book because that's the reality of these things. Uh, age and time and, and uh, being on planet earth in general changes people's memories. And uh, it's a very fluid, fluid thing. Uh, Darren Zvengel. Hello. Michael says as a printer, I got to say the print job on the book is great. Yeah. I especially like the, the, how the paperback uh, cover feels and looks and, and it's a nice, it's a nice, uh, nice heavy book. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, will there be an audio book? Well, wouldn't that be great? Uh, well, I will tell you this book, when we first started planning it, um, the deluxe hardcover version, it was originally, we had all these great crazy ideas that, you know, not all of these are realistic, but one of the things we wanted to do was put a, in the spine of the book, we wanted to put a USB stick, which had audio interviews, pictures that didn't make the book, uh, just tons of content, free content, but that never happened. That was just uh, not uh, on the table at the end of the day. So Tom Patterson, Devotech, K-D-N-L-F-M, thank you so much for the tip. It's very nice of you. And I appreciate you. And thanks for watching today. Shiny happy Jen says, I'm glad this was released. It's a paperback. Always good. Yeah, we had to, uh, because the very uh, limited edition hardcover expensive editions 
uh, sold out very quickly. And, and let me just tell you that the um, super deluxe version was actually two books, two hardcover books, Unmasked and uh, the brand in a rubber bound, cool deluxe box with a big art print that came with it and all this stuff. And then there was actually a, a, a version like this, but hardcover, a flip book version with a rubberized cover that was released. That was also fairly expensive, but those sold out so quickly. And um, the Oprah book club book, God, wouldn't that be great if she chose this as uh, her book club book, that would just be one of the most devolved things I had heard of. Uh, Wayne uh, H Tom C 42 says, how about one of those floppy records at mad magazine? Yeah. Flexi discs. Wouldn't that be cool? Well, you know, Jerry was saying that there was a lot of content that didn't go in here that we would have liked to have seen in there. And since this book has come out, we've discovered of course, more imagery and more content. So Maybe there's room for another Devo book down the line. Um, so uh, we certainly have imagery for it and, um, and stories and, and more to tell and more to show. So we will uh, hopefully get into that. Uh, Mariana Silva, thank you. Cheers, cheers Michael. Thank you very much. Um, uh, 740 AM says, years ago, I remember Bob Dylan had a book with a CD of audio interviews in it. Yeah, that, we really wanted to do that, but, but getting the rights to – reproduce those interviews, whether they were audio or video or whatever, it was uh, too many hurdles and the, the publisher didn't want to deal with it or didn't want to pay for it or whatever the case may be. There were interviews uh, in particular that I remember when I was a kid by a guy um, named Jim Ladd, Jim L-A-D-D, -D, Jim Ladd. He did a show called Interview. It was I N N E R V interview. He, you know, interviewed a whole bunch of bands back then, like Boston, Dire Straits, whatever. But he did do two interviews with Devo, one in 1980 and one in 1981. And I actually heard these on the radio uh, way back in the 80s. And uh, Devo talked about politics, religion, uh, rebellion, uh, lots of stuff that people weren't talking about on pop radio back then. So uh, I recorded them on cassette when I was a kid, wore them out. And then later in life found the actual vinyl radio copy, radio station promo copies of these interviews that were never meant to be uh, distributed to the public. Anyway, those interviews I've always wanted to see um, mass produced in some way. And uh, we're still trying to figure out if that's even possible. Um, so we'll see. Uh, but yeah, uh, what do we got here? We got uh, 75 people watching. That's pretty good. Uh, thank you for the thumbs ups. We got a pretty, pretty good amount of thumbs ups and thank you for the thumbs down. Whoever that was, that helps too. You know, got it, you know, got to respect the thumbs down. You know, it is interaction. At least it's interaction. And that's what we, we want here is we want interaction with people. Uh, now, if, if we are good to go, do you guys uh, want to call tonight? I mean, I'm kind of tired of talking, but I could, I could be here if you guys really need something answered or, uh, uh you really need, uh, my, my company right now. Oh, so, ah, uh, that was great. That went pretty smoothly. Um, there was a little bit of, uh, tension right before I went on because Jerry was having a little trouble figuring out how to use the StreamYard link I sent him, but about two minutes before I went live, we figured it out and all was good. So, yep, keep a positive attitude. Lee Victor, you're welcome, Lee Victor. Of course, thank you for always showing up here. We, we appreciate that. Um, uh, yeah, Zeb, Greg, uh, did the Funkos sell out? I don't think so, Greg. I'm not even sure if that's possible. Do they, do they make limited uh, numbers of them? I, I don't know how that Funko thing works, really. But uh, if it's pre-sale, I don't think they, could, they would sell out. But I'll look into that. I can... I can Talk to Funko Monday. Uh, writer Jordan Gory, Jory Lurie says, has Jerry told you any good Rico Kasich or Alan Vega stories? Um, you know, not that I remember. Not that I remember. Um, I have a quick uh, Rico Kasich story, which I'm not sure if I've told you guys or not. But one day in the, I don't know, it was 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, somewhere around there, I was in Hollywood for a, a Devo concert or a tour or something. And I was uh, at Mutata Musica, Mark's studio on Sunset Boulevard. And uh, I was walking out to get lunch or something. So I was walking up Sunset Boulevard. And back then, Sunset Boulevard had a lot of like fancy restaurants on the street with, with outdoor seating kind of like on the sidewalk. So as you would walk by these places, you would get to see all these fancy, wealthy people eating. Uh, 
And um, as I was walking by one of these places, I noticed something stood out to me amongst all the people that were there sitting. Somebody really stood out to me and it was Rick Ocasek sitting with his family. And his family all looked like normal people like everybody else. But Rick Ocasek looked like Rick Ocasek out of like every, you know, cars video I'd seen in the eighties, same hair. I think he even had one of those jackets on with the shoulder pads in it. And it was just so, it was like, it, I was watching a cars video, but it was at a little restaurant on sunset Boulevard. I don't know. It was uh, one of those things where I kind of wanted to break out my camera, but I didn't. And I just wanted to really remember that moment. And so I did burned it in my memory. Um, so, um, so yeah. Uh, Am I missing something? Did I get everybody? Oh, I'm a little, uh, I'm a little winded. I'm a little winded, but I think that was really fun. And I'm really glad we got to show you just about every page of that book. Uh, again, um, if you have any more questions about it uh, that you think of later, feel free to get in touch with me. My email address is pretty easy to find uh, on any number of the websites. I run clubdevo.com, devo-obsesso.com, ithrup.com. Uh, the dickies.com, all these websites have my contact info. So if you want to send me questions via email, I'll make note of them. I'll ask Jerry for the answers or I'll, or I'll give you the answers. And, and maybe one day on an upcoming stream, I'll rattle off those answers. We do this stream, not typically on Saturdays. We are typically Thursdays at 7 p.m. EST every week. So come on back and see us every now and then we'll do a special stream like this on a day that's not Thursday. And, um, yeah, uh, let's uh, let's see. Anything here that I need to do? Can't get into those Funko figures. Don't see the appeal of those black-eyed vinyl thingies. You know, shiny, happy Jen, I kind of feel you there. You know, I'm not a big toy collector myself. Uh, I'm not really into having a bunch of plastic stuff like that around the house. But since I've started working with Funko on these Devo figures, they have sent me a couple of boxes of, of free Funkos, which are really cool. You know, they appeal to the child in me. They're of bands that I loved when I was a teenager, Iron Maiden, Kiss, you know, stuff like that. I just got a new box of Funko uh, gifts, uh, which I shot an unboxing video for, which I will put up in the next couple of days. It's a very short video, just one box of figures that um, I was surprised to get. So that's coming up. But yeah, I think, you know, maybe Funkos could be the, the beanie babies of, uh, of our generation. Who knows? Uh, they're really popular, though. They're very, very popular. And I always thought a Funko Devo collaboration should have happened uh, a long time ago. And the same with Lego. I think Lego and Funko and Devo are just matches made in heaven, uh, if you believe in heaven. And uh, I think that I think Lego is still on the list. I really got to get them to uh, to do something there. Um, uh, Derek Lowe says, My, met Michael in Glasgow and at Devotional 2015. What an experience. Derek, that was fun, right? You should come over to the Devotional again when we start having them as physical events. Uh, that would be great. Uh, the Devo Funko things could lead to new things, and they will, and they have, and they are, and we're working on new things, and there's lots of stuff going on behind the scenes that I really can't tell you about, but man, oh man, I really want to. And um, just rest assured, lots of Devo stuff coming down the pike. Um yeah, you don't like the Funkos or the bobbleheads, Abnorm. I know. Well, you have to you have to be a toy collector, and you have to, uh, you know, there's a lot. There was requests for that kind of stuff, though. And so when Devo gets enough requests for something, we'll typically uh, make it available. Um, but yeah, I understand your your point on those. Uh, but yeah, let's say hey, Billy the Punk. We must repeat. Oh yes, we will. Yes, we will repeat. So I think we can shut it down. I think that's all good. I think we did what we came here to do. I really appreciate everybody's support, everybody who just came to watch. I appreciate it. The thumbs ups, the subscriptions, all that stuff is icing on the cake. Just the fact that you guys were here participating in any way, even if it was just like looking at us on the video. Thank you. And um, we will see you guys. Oh, look, a rainstorm is starting. So perfect time to end this before uh, internet gets crazy here. So duty now for the future, my friends. I really appreciate you guys being here. I can't thank you enough. May the rock and roll gods bless you as they have blessed me. And I mean that. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Uh, bless ye, bless ye. And de-evolution is real, okay? Later, kids.